Thank you for joining us online today. We are so thankful that you took the time to stop by and see what God is doing here at Family Church. Now, if this ministry has changed your life in any way, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at changelife at familychurch.tv. We would also like you to like us on Facebook and to subscribe to our YouTube page. Now take a listen to this week's message. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. I'm in a series right now entitled Classic Christmas. Classic Christmas. I want, I want, to, I want to start in the book of Luke. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 2 or maybe you just want to follow along on the screen. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. I want to stop right there just for a moment. These were not regular shepherds. These were the shepherds of Bethlehem. The shepherds of Bethlehem were entrusted with raising the sacrificial lambs used in the temple. So just think about all the times they would have attended to the birth of those lambs. And now here they are attending to the birth of the Lamb of God. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? Verse 9 goes on and says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And of course, that's the story of the birth of Jesus and Last week, our focus was on the message of the wise men, and we talked about Bethlehem being the house of bread, and how that these wise men came to the house of bread searching for the bread of life, because what they had going on in their hearts wasn't, feel, wasn't really um, filling them up. And we learned how that Jesus is really the only one that we can turn to whenever life leaves us feeling empty. Because how many of you know Jesus is the only one who can truly fill us up, right? So this morning we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to talk about the message of the angels. Because the angels remind us how important our relationships are. How many of you know relationships are important? And so God sends the angels to remind us that our relationships are are important. Christmas is all about relationships. And on this Christmas, God wants you to know that your relationships can be classic. Remember the definition of classic? Classic was the highest quality. It means a standard of excellence. And it also means the best of its kind. And that's what God wants for your relationships. He wants them to be quality, excellent, and the very best. Don't be like this guy. He said, ever since it started snowing on Christmas Eve, all my wife has done is press her face to the window pane. If it gets any colder, I guess I'll have to let her in. (laughs) Don't be like him. So today we're going to focus on the last part of verse 14, because in the last part of verse 14, the angels show up and they they proclaim a message. And the message is this, on earth peace. I like to share this verse at least once during the holidays, because I really believe that that's the heart of God. On earth peace. Did you know that Jesus wants you to have peace in every area of your life? where there's conflict he does and in order for that to happen a reconciliation must take place and so let's talk about the definition of reconciliation what does that mean reconciliation means the reestablishing of a relationship it's the mending of a relationship that was broken or severed by some outside force i bet that you have at least one of those in your life How many of you would be honest and say that you have at least one relationship in your life 
that has been broken or severed by some outside force. Come on, let me see your hand. Okay, probably nearly all of us. So I think we have the right message this morning. So why do we need reconciliation? Let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I want you to notice that Jesus is the source of reconciliation. He's the one who helps us bring those relationships back together no matter how broken they are. And I know that each of us here today maybe, maybe have some relationships in our lives that were at one time good, but something happened and now that relationship is shattered. It's not what it used to be and it's for sure not what it needs to be. And if that's you this morning, then you need to understand that God has a plan to help you in that area. Not every relationship can be saved, but they can all be salvaged. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. So why do we need reconciliation? Simply put, it's because relationships are hard. Right? Relationships are hard. In the last 6,000 years, nearly 15,000 wars have been fought. Half of those were at your house. (laughs) Some of you are thinking, how does he know? (laughs) We human beings don't seem to be very good at living at peace with one another. I think that we need peace in at least three areas, and I want to talk to you about those three areas today. Number one, first, we need peace with God. Secondly, we need peace with others. And thirdly, we need peace with ourselves. Why? Because this Christmas, God wants to turn conflict and chaos into calmness. How does that sound? This Christmas, God wants to swap tension for harmony. How does that sound? Good. So fortunately for us, one of the great purposes of Christmas is that God wants there to be peace in your world. Now we all, you know, kind of come from different worlds. Some of us um, work outside the home. Some of us work inside the home. Some of us maybe have larger families than others. Some of us are married. Some of us are single. Some of us are divorced. We're kind of all in different places. And so I would say that We all have different areas where there is conflict, where we need Jesus to come and help us. Why? Because I honestly believe without the supernatural presence of God in our hearts, it would be impossible for us to live at peace with others. Because we're all so different. We have different ideas. We have different ways of doing things. We were all brought up differently. We all approach life differently. It really is a miracle with all of our differences that we get along at all. I heard this story about a husband and wife who were having a big fight before church on Sunday morning. They weren't speaking, but they got in the car and headed to service. Halfway there, they drove by a field of mules. And the wife said to the husband, are those your people? (laughs) And he said, yes, (laughs) in-laws. There was a survey taken at a local shopping mall and they ask Christmas shoppers, where would you like to see peace this Christmas? And here, here are some of the responses. I would like to see peace with my parents, my ex, and my kids. I need peace in my heart and in my mind. I have a lot of rude people in my world, and peace might help with that. 
Honestly, if I don't find peace soon, my marriage will be over. Another said, I think I need peace in just about every area of my life. So let me ask you that question this morning. What are some areas where you would like to see peace this Christmas? I bet you have a list. Maybe even some of your responses would be the same responses that were given in the survey. I have found there are two main causes of conflict. Number one is just our own natural self-centeredness. This is when my way of doing things and your way of doing things clash. There's no compromise, and so sparks fly. Our own natural self-centeredness. And second, the second cause of conflict is the result of unmet needs. Sometimes you just have to be honest about what you need. And here's why. You don't have the right to be mad at someone who doesn't know why you're mad. But it does happen. And so we know this. We know that there will be conflict. So let's spend the rest of our time together today talking about the three kinds of peace that we need and how that we can experience peace because of that first Christmas and how that it was classic. And God wants you to have a classic Christmas this Christmas. Number one, first of all, number one, we need peace with God. When you're living in a way that is not God's way, whether you realize it or not, you are in conflict with God. It's like there's this cosmic tug of war happening in your life and you're pulling this way and God's trying to pull you back and, and then you're, you're pulling against God and then he's trying to, to pull you back and there are, are a lot of people that are just kind of in this unspoken war with God and they don't even know it. And I think that Christians can have different areas in their lives where they are at war with God and the symptoms of being at war with God are easy to spot and I'm going to take them right out of the scripture. So here are some symptoms at being at war with God. Irritability, quick temper, insecurity, impatience, manipulation, arrogance, holding grudges. And those are just to name a few. Now, the Bible calls those things the works of our flesh. And we know that everything connected to our flesh always produces death, right? But the Apostle Paul said that everything connected to the Spirit produces life and peace. So that's the test. So you look at your life and you see what it's producing. Is it producing death or is it producing life and is it producing peace? So to be at peace with God, we have to replace some of those wrong behaviors with right behaviors. And the right behaviors are called the fruit of the Spirit. Now that sounds kind of churchy, but all that means is that there is evidence in your behavior that you are a Christian. So what are some of the evidences that you are a Christian? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so peace with God through his son Jesus is what produces those things in your life. No one else can do that and nothing else can compensate for that. And I will go one step further and say, until you find peace with God, you will never find peace with yourself and you will never be at peace with other people. Because it starts with peace with God. And then all of a sudden you, you start to get tools and you start to get um, revelation and wisdom how to navigate those other relationships. So, so number one, you need peace with God. Number two, you need peace with yourself. What is it that robs you of your peace? Most of the time it falls into three categories. Uncontrollable circumstances like illness, death, or job loss unchangeable people, and unexplainable problems. With all these peace robbers, how can we ever be at peace with ourselves? I, uh, I'm not really much for reading prayers, but, but, but I love the serenity prayer. Has anyone ever read the serenity prayer? I think that's good. 
And even though it was written over a hundred years ago, I think it brings the scripture together in a practical way. And I believe AA still uses this prayer even today to help people with addiction. And I thought I might just read it this morning. The serenity prayer says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the life to come. I, I just love that prayer because what's the message of that prayer? The message of that prayer is that peace with ourselves comes from enjoying one day at a time, accepting what cannot be changed instead of worrying about it, trusting God's love, and surrendering to God's plan. We can all do that, right? Because God wants you to know that you can be at peace. You say, yeah, but Pastor Larry, you don't understand about all of the chaos and all of the drama that is in my life right now. Listen, God wants you to understand that because Jesus came on that first Christmas that you can find calmness in all that chaos. Because God doesn't always change your circumstances, but I'll tell you what God will do. God will change you. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And because of that, whatever's happening around you, I get it. There are seasons of life that are difficult. We've been praying with people here for the last month that are going through really troubling situations. Things that they cannot change. Unexplainable problems, unchangeable people, circumstances that they cannot control. And we all know what it's like to go through those things. But because of Jesus, we have this source of life and this source of hope that lives on the inside of us. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? I can't do anything about some people, but I can do a whole lot about me. Because of Jesus, I can be at peace with who I am and who God made me to be. Because of Jesus, you can be at peace with who you are and who God made you to be. And it's okay to drive in the lane that God created you to drive in. Because we're all so different. So you can be at peace with where you are because of Jesus. So we need peace with God. We need peace with ourselves. And finally, the last one, and this is really where, where I'm trying to get to this morning because this one is so important. We need peace with others. Now, earlier I had you lift your hand whenever I was talking about a relationship that had been broken had been severed, needed to be reestablished. I want you to think about that relationship just for a moment this morning before we move forward. Because only God can fix it. Have you ever tried to fix a relationship on your own? What happens? Mushroom cloud. Only God can fix it. And so if we want God's results, we have to do things God's way. So when it comes to having peace with others, what does that look like? Well, once you've made peace with God through his son Jesus, and once you've made peace with yourself, knowing that it's okay to be who God made you to be, now comes the hardest part, living at peace with other people. One of God's greatest desires for your life is that you live at peace with other people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, I want to read this to you this morning because it really brings this all together in a practical way. It says, all this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us 
to settle our relationships with one another. Wow. Did you know that God has called you? Remember when you were little and your mom called you and you didn't come? What would usually happen? My kids got waterboarded. (laughs) What would happen? It would create problems for you. Every parent's different. Some parents, you know, whip. Some parents have timeouts and different things. But no matter what the parenting style was, you knew that it was going to create problems for you. And when you forget that God has called you, we have all these people running around saying, I don't know what I'm called to do. I can tell you at least one thing that you're called to do. You're called to be at peace with other people. And if you're not being and living at peace with other people, then you are out of your calling. Because God has called you to do it. Those of you that have kids, when you call your kids, to the dinner table, would it be okay if they just ignored you? Some of you are like, yes, I don't like my kids. <laughs> they can sit in there. No one likes being, when you're calling someone, you don't like it when they ignore you. And yet that's exactly the way we are with God sometimes. Because God has called you to be at peace with other people. Well, I don't want to be. You don't get to choose. It's not up for debate. God isn't taking a poll this morning to see how you feel about it. God has called you to settle your relationships with other people. That's that's what you are called by God to do. So the question is this, do you have a relationship that is not settled? One of the evidences that Christ is in your life is that you will start to see a difference in your relationships. How many of you would like to see God's blessing on your life and career? How does that happen? Jesus said this, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, I want to see God's blessing on my life. But I hate her. (laughs) Good luck with that. Well, I want to see God's blessing on my life, but I'm going to run him down all over town. Good luck with that. It can't happen. It's contrary to the scriptures. Jesus said, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers. So the path to a blessed life depends greatly on how well you play with others. So here's your choice. You can be a peacemaker or you can be a troublemaker. How do you know? Do you make life more peaceful for people or do you make life more troubled for people? That's how you know. It's really simple. Yeah, but Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm just pointing out all their shortcomings. <laughs> I'm just pointing out all the ways they've hurt my 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 feelings. Listen, who made you the high sheriff of heaven? <laughs> who, who gave you the Holy Spirit's job? See, from the Holy Spirit, it's conviction. From you, it's criticism. Oh, man, I'm preaching good today. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit corrects me, I don't feel criticized. When someone else corrects me, oftentimes it does feel like criticism, unless they're offering it with the right heart and speaking the truth to me in love, which I need sometimes. But that's usually not how criticism works. Jesus, notice that Jesus said this. He said, he never said, blessed are the peace lovers. He he said, blessed are the peacemakers. So what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, simply put, a peacemaker actively seeks to end a conflict. A peacemaker takes initiative when the relationship breaks down and looks for ways to mend the brokenness that has occurred. Now, I think there there are two reasons why 
that we're not very good at this. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach back and pull some things out of my counseling days. I think there are two reasons why we're not very good at this. Number one, we don't understand the difference between reconciliation and resolution. And I want to explain that to you this morning. We're afraid that if we reconcile the relationship, it will return to something that is hurtful and dysfunctional and that nothing will really ever change. But reconciliation is not the same as resolution. Reconciliation ends hostility. Reconciliation says we aren't going to fight anymore. But it doesn't mean that you have solved all the problems in the relationship. It just means that you've decided to have peace on earth. So how does that look in your life? Reconciliation focuses on the relationship. Resolution focuses on the problem. So always focus on reconciliation first because until you get the relationship right, you're never going to get the problem right. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to fix the relationship because if you can't fix the relationship, no one is going to care about fixing the problem. Does that make sense? And if you're going through a divorce or you've been divorced, you can find reconciliation even if there's no resolution. You don't have to spend years sh shooting shots at each other across the yard. And so even if you can't figure out how to stay married because of Jesus, you can figure out how to be at peace with one another. And I'll just go ahead and say this. If you have kids, being at peace is more important than you being right. Amen. So you always start by trying to fix the relationship. Fix the relationship first. If you can fix the relationship, then you can start working to fix the problems. You with me? So it's me saying to Scott, if we're in a conflict... We're not going to fight anymore. You can keep that crazy looking beard. <laughs> but we're not going to fight about it anymore. Are you and Renee having that fight right now? You are? Oh, my. Wait, let's not move on. <laughs> Is there something you want to share, Renee? Oh, okay. <laughs> Man. No, I think it looks good. Right? There are, four, there are four stages in every man's life. You believe in Santa Claus. You don't believe in Santa Claus. You are Santa Claus. You look like Santa Claus. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're on the last phase there, brother. <laughs> I don't even know what we're talking about. We, you fit, you, ah, uh, Yes. Okay, they like it. You fix, you, how many of you know you fix the relationship first? Okay, so you start with reconciliation and then you move toward resolution. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons why we're bad at it. Number two, the second reason is this. We don't understand the difference between forgiveness and trust. We forgive so that we can get on with our lives and not be stuck in the past. See, forgiveness has to do with the past. Forgiveness takes care of the past. Trust, however, is about the future, and it has to be earned back over time. But we don't understand that. We think that if we forgive them, then we're just going to be expected to just suddenly start trusting them again. You can forgive someone and not trust them, Trust has to be earned back over time, and if someone is learning to trust you again, you need to just be patient with that person. So we don't understand the difference between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness says, I'm not going to hold what you did against you. But trust says, I'm going to need you to show me that things are going to be different now. 
I think, I think um, Ronald Reagan said, said it like this. He said, um, trust with verification. It's like, you know, there's going to come a point where I'm going to trust you again, but I'm going to need some verification that you're not going to cut my throat again. So you can forgive someone and start working on the relationship even if you don't trust that person. Because now the ball's in their court. You follow me? All right, we got four more minutes here. I want to finish up with something. Here are some easy things that you can do if you want to be a peacemaker. Now, I suggest that you go home today and read Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to give you the, the bullet points. Because Jesus really walks through this with his disciples He goes in a lot more depth than I'm going to go into. Easy things that you can do if you want to be a peacemaker this Christmas. Number one, do what Jesus said. Number one, and go to them. Matthew chapter 18 principle. Don't go to anyone else. Because that's what your flesh wants to do. If you have a problem, you go to them. What's that mean? That means I'm your pastor. If you have a problem, my door is open. Can we all agree on that? That means if you have a problem with one of the staff people here at Family Church, I'll make sure their doors are open. Can we all agree on that? That means if you have a problem with someone in your family, then you go to them. If you have a problem with someone at your job, where do you go? (laughs) To them. I'm just making sure you guys are all still with me. Anytime there's a breakdown, Jesus said, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Some of you are like, not here, I don't. (laughs) Anytime there's a breakdown, Jesus said, you are to go to them. So you go to them. Well, okay, I went to them, but it didn't work. Jesus knew that sometimes it won't work. And so he's really smart, and he says, okay, if it doesn't work, here's what you do now. You go back to them. This time, bring at least one or two other people with you. Go back to them. He said said, that way every word is established by, by, by two or three witnesses. That way... If you go back to them and you go back to them with the right heart and you go to them and you say, I'm sorry for the breakdown. I'm sorry for my contribution to the breakdown. I need you to forgive me. And they still won't forgive you or be in relationship with you. Then at least you have some other people there and it's not just your word against their word. But it doesn't stop there because Jesus knew that sometimes even then it wouldn't be fixed. And so he gives us a third step. He gives us a next level step. Does anyone know what the next level step is? He says, take it to the church. That's what the staff and I are here for. If you can't get along with people, we are here to help you get along with people. That's what we're here for. If you you can't figure it out, then we're here to sit down with you and sit down with them and try to figure it out. So he said, go. He said, first you go on your own. If you can't figure it out, take a couple trusted friends, go back, try to figure it out. Can't figure it out. He said, then get your spiritual leaders involved. Because when you involve spiritual leaders, like myself and the staff, we're not going to care how you feel. We're going to look at scripture. And that's what we're going to do. Because that's the only way that things get better. So, so number one, what do you do? You go to them. And you say to them, I am sorry. <laughs> oh, man, that's going to be hard. <laughs> right, Rick? <laughs> but it worked, didn't it? Yeah. You mind if I say a couple things about that? Okay. Rick was having a problem with someone very close. Not Donna. 
Oh, okay. Hey, he said it. Hey, let's put it out there. Mother-in-law. Forty-four year problem. He came to me and said, I don't know what to do. I said, you go to her and you tell her that you are sorry. And what did you say? <laughs> I'm not going and I'm not sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's true. <laughs> So we worked through some things, but then you, he did. Yeah, he did. And, and, and you know, it, it, some supernatural things happened, and, and you know, the, that relationship, I'm sure, is not perfect, as none of our relationships are perfect, but it's better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can be in the same room. That's, that's a start. Yeah. But nonetheless, what did Jesus, he, he, you know, that's exactly what Jesus said to do. If you have a problem with someone, you go. You go. And isn't that, isn't that what, my timer says zero, so I'm going to take my glasses back off so I can't see it. <laughs> And isn't that what spiritual maturity does? You know, Jesus is being pounded to the cross and, and you know, Jesus, Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And so spiritual maturity reaches out and reaches past that. So go, that's the number one step. Go, well, I don't want to go. Well, I guess live miserable and die, I guess. I don't know what else to do. I, I can't help you. Moving right along. <laughs> Number two, start with reconciliation, not resolution. In other words, don't go to try to solve the problem. Go to try and mend the relationship. Go and say, I don't want to fight about this anymore. I'm sorry. Once the relationship is restored you probably will find that resolution will take care of itself. Number three. This is right out of Matthew 18, okay? Number three, empath empathize with the other person's feelings and listen to why they feel that way. I don't care how they feel. <laughs> well, they probably don't care how you feel. But you can listen. And then finally, number four, always look for common ground and be willing to see your contribution to the breakdown. I've never seen, I, I, I've never seen anything that was totally one-sided. Never. There's always two sides to every pancake. And I have found that if you flip it around long enough, you start to see the truth, because the, there's your side, there's their side, and then the truth is usually somewhere in here. <laughs> and so you have to be willing to see your contribution to the breakdown. So go to them. Start with re reconciliation. Empathize with how they feel. Look for common ground and be willing to see your contribution to the breakdown. And at least that's a place to start. Okay? All right, we're going to stop. You can stand with me today. Now, we're going to pray for these relationships in just a minute. But before we do that, <clears throat> let's just go ahead. The musicians are coming back and the prayer team's coming. Before we do that, let's just, let's just go ahead and pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and, like we always do, just thankful and grateful that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In fact, you said as far as the east is from the west, 
your ways are higher than our ways. Lord, that cannot be measured. And I will be the first to admit that I don't always have things figured out. And I will be the first to admit that my flesh oftentimes, especially in relationship breakdowns, wants to rise up and start demanding my rights or maybe even reminding me of how I've been wronged. But Lord, on that first Christmas, I don't think that it was an accident when the angel choir showed up, when the heavenly host showed up and joined the announcing angel who was there announcing the birth of Jesus, when, when the band showed up, their message was on earth peace. Peace was a really big part of that first Christmas. And so every year as we approach Christmas, my mind always goes to peace, peace with God, peace with others, peace with myself. And so Lord, today we just pray that that peace would come and that you would do a deep work in this place this morning, that you would mend, Lord, that you would mend relationships. They may never be restored they may never be put back like they were, but they can be mended in a way to where we're not living miserably. Lord, remind us that forgiveness isn't for the other person. Forgiveness is for us. Remind us of that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.